who had explored the frontiers of AI at universities in Britain, the United States, and Canada since the early 1970s, Hinton made the trip to NIPS nearly every year. But this was different. Although Chinese interest in his company was already locked in, he knew that others were interested too, and NIPS seemed like the ideal venue for an auction. Two months earlier, Hinton and his students had changed the way machines saw the world. They had built what was called a neural network, a mathematical system modelled on the web of neurons in the brain, and it could identify common objects, like flowers, dogs and cars, with an accuracy that had previously seemed impossible. As Hinton and his students showed, a neural network could learn this very human skill by analysing vast amounts of data. He called this deep learning, and its potential was enormous. It promised to transform not just computer vision, but everything from talking digital assistants to driverless cars to drug discovery. The idea of a neural network dated back to the 1950s, but the early pioneers had never gotten it working as well as they had hoped. By the new millennium, most researchers had given up on the idea, convinced it was a technological dead end and bewildered by the fifty-year-old conceit that these mathematical systems somehow mimicked the human brain. When submitting research papers to academic journals, those who still explore the technology would often disguise it as something else, replacing the words neural network with language less likely to offend their fellow scientists. Hinton remained one of the few who believed it would one day fulfill its promise, delivering machines that could not only recognize objects, but identify spoken words, understand natural language, carry on a conversation, and maybe even solve problems humans couldn't solve on their own, providing new and more incisive ways of exploring the mysteries of biology, medicine, geology, and other sciences. It was an eccentric stance, even inside his own university, which spent years denying his standing request to hire another professor who could work alongside him in this long and winding struggle to build machines that learned on their own. One crazy person working on this was enough, he says. But in the spring and summer of 2012, Hinton and his two students made a breakthrough. They showed that a neural network could recognize common objects with an accuracy beyond any other technology. With the nine-page paper they unveiled that fall, they announced to the world, that this idea was as powerful as Hinton had long claimed it would be. Days later, Hinton received an email from a fellow AI researcher named Kai Yu, who worked for Baidu, the Chinese tech giant. On the surface, Hinton and Yu had little in common. Born in post-war Britain to a family of monumental scientists whose influence was matched only by their eccentricity, Hinton had studied at Cambridge, earned a PhD in artificial intelligence from the University of Edinburgh and spent the next 30 years as a professor of computer science. Born 30 years after Hinton, Yu grew up in communist China, the son of an automobile engineer, and studied in Nanjing and then Munich before moving to Silicon Valley for a job in a corporate research lab. The two were separated by class, age, culture, language and geography but they shared an unusual interest, neural networks. They had originally met in Canada at an academic workshop, part of a grassroots effort to revive this nearly dormant area of research across the scientific community and rebrand the idea as deep learning. Yu was among those who helped spread the new gospel. Returning to China, he took the idea to Baidu, where his research caught the eye of the company's CEO. When that nine-page paper emerged from the University of Toronto, you told the Baidu Brain Trust they should hire Hinton as quickly as possible. With his email, he introduced Hinton to a Baidu vice president, who offered $12 million for just a few years of work. At first, Hinton's suitors in Beijing felt they had reached an agreement. But Hinton wasn't so sure. In recent months, he'd cultivated relationships inside several other companies, both small and large, including two of Baidu's big American rivals. And they, too, were calling his office in Toronto.